All right, our next speaker is uh, Bill, I say William B. Grant, has a PhD in physics from the University of California, Berkeley, in 1971. He has had a 30-year career in atmospheric sciences with an emphasis on laser remote sensing of atmospheric constituents, such as ozone and aerosols, with positions at SRI International, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, California Institute of Technology, and NASA Langley Research Center. He turned to health research in 1996, publishing the first paper linking diet to risk of Alzheimer's disease in 1997, followed by studies of sugar, fat, and coronary heart disease in 1998, and animal products and cancer risk in 1998. In 1999, he turned his attention to the role of solar ultraviolet B exposure in reducing risk of many types of cancer through production of vitamin D in 2012. After retirement from NASA in 2000, I'm sorry, 2002. After retirement from NASA in 2004, he moved to San Francisco and formed the nonprofit organization Sunlight Nutrition and Health Research Center, which is www.sunarc.org where he spends most of his time studying the role of UVB, solar UVB exposure, and vitamin D in reducing risk of cancer and many other types of disease. He also investigates the role of diet in risk of Alzheimer's disease in cancer. He has about 300 health publications listed at www.pubmed.gov, of which 210 are related to vitamin D, with 78% of these also on ultraviolet radiation and human health and 41 to diet and disease. Please welcome Bill Grant. Thank you. I'm delighted to be back here again. Uh, I really have enjoyed this organization. I, Mark Corrick invited me into it about 13, 12 or 13 years ago, and I've been involved ever since. But don't come to the meetings very often now because it's, I'm in San Francisco, and it's a long way down here and back. Um, let's see. There we go. I do receive funding from Biotech Pharmacal. That's a vitamin company that's a supplier of research-grade vitamin D for health professionals and consumers. Uh, they have a website, biotechpharmacal.com. So I'm going to discuss a number of topics related to vitamin D this evening. Uh, first of all, vitamin D physiology. Then I'm going to put the vitamin D recommendations right up in front because I think that's what you're most interested in. Uh, then I'll tell you why vitamin D is important uh, in terms of which health outcomes are related to low vitamin D, uh, where is the vitamin D policy headed, um, some of my latest research on how vitamin D clinical trials should be conducted, and then uh, tell you where to go for additional information. So vitamin D3, uh, that's cholecalciferol, can be made in the skin or obtained from uh, food or supplements. There's also a, a vitamin D2, ergocalciferol, which is made from mushrooms or ye yeast or fungi. Uh, that's not as effective as vitamin D3. It doesn't last as long, and it's not clear that it has the same health benefits. But some people who are vegans want to have no animal products, and all vitamin D3 is made from animal products, or almost all. There is a, now a plant-sourced vitamin D3 but the vegans often want to go with the D2. Uh, the liver converts vitamin D3 to 25-hydroxy vitamin D3 by adding a hydroxyl group. And they have, this is what is measured in, uh, when you go to the doctor's office and want to know what your, your blood level of vitamin D is. The half-life of this 25-hydroxy vitamin D is about two and a half weeks. Uh, now, the kidney converts the 25-hydroxy vitamin D to 125-dihydroxy. Uh, dihydroxy vitamin D, um, and this, this and the parathyroid hormone, PTH, help keep serum calcium within a tight range. Uh, the 125 increases calcium absorption from the intestines, whereas the PTH increases calcium absorption from the bones. So you have sort of a, a push and pull. And so it's, it's um, there's not a direct correlation between the amount of 25 and 125, but the more 25 you have, the uh, more 125 you can make. Um, 
there are other actions of vitamin D, and that's what I primarily study. Most of the action of vitamin D is through the 125 uh, entering vitamin D receptors, uh, which are coupled to chromosomes in nearly every cell of the body. Uh, when activated, the VDRs control the expression of many genes, upregulating most of them, downregulating others. And it turns out that not only the kidney can convert the 25 to 125, but also other organs as needed. So for example, if you have cancer uh, someplace, uh, the cells in that organ can also convert the 25 to 125. And the skin can convert 25 to 125. Uh, now, vitamin D also fights bacterial and some viral infections by inducing production of cathelicidin. That's a polypeptide with antimicrobial and anti-endotoxin properties. Um, vitamin D also induces, reduces inflammation by reducing the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines, which are chemical messengers. Um, to underscore the importance of vitamin D for human health, I note that skin pigmentation varies globally depending on where people live for hundreds to thousands of years. Uh, for example, the, the Aborigines in Australia are very dark skinned. Their ancestors were from the forests of, of the Indonesia where, where, where they were brown skinned. But when they got to Australia with no, no uh, trees to cover them, they needed the very dark skin to protect them from the very, very uh, intense UV. So dark skin in the tropics reduces uh, the risk of free radical formation of skin cancer, as well as uh, protecting against folate destruction. And folate is very important for pregnancy. And, and, uh, for pregnancy. Now, as, as humans moved out of Africa and started moving northward, uh, they had to develop lighter skin in order to make enough vitamin D uh, from, the, from the less intense UV. And they didn't need the protection of, the, of dark pigment against the free radicals and the folate destruction. What would happen, they would get more infectious diseases like uh, tuberculosis. They would also get more rickets and poor bone formation. And so then the pelvic cavity wouldn't be large enough to let a, a fetus, uh, let an infant come out um, in the birth process. And they hadn't invented C-sections. Uh, thousands of years ago. Um, now, Nina Joblonsky and George Chaplin uh, made a career out of going around the world and measuring uh, the un-UV exposed pigment in many peoples around the world. And they have this, developed this map of skin pigmentation. They see very dark in the tropics uh, where, where you have no trees, uh, brown, uh, lighter color in the, in the tropical forest and very light in the uh, high latitudes. So now let's get to recommendations, which um, I gave a talk in Hungary last month. And after I gave all the information about what the benefits are, all, all, all I wanted to know was, well, how much do I need? And how much should I, what should my level be? So in 2011, the Institute of Medicine uh, announced that uh, adults up to the age of 70 years old should have 600 IU per day over 70 years, they should have 800 IU per day. And that 20 nanograms per milliliter uh, vitamin D concentration, was, uh, 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentration was just fine. Well, it turns out that that was a, not a very sound study. First of all, they were, this was funded by the Food and Drug Administration and the um, National Institutes of, uh, Institute of Health and Health Canada. And the two U.S. organizations work very closely with Big Pharma. And um, uh, also one of the organizers, uh, one of the people on the committee had planned a, another major vitamin D clinical trial where people could take, we're going to take 2,000 IU of vitamin D per day in the treatment arm, but they could all, anybody in the treatment or the uh, control arm could take as much as the Institute of Medicine recommended. So in order not to sabotage her uh, clinical trial, uh, she pushed, I think, very hard for these recommendations. But in order to reach these recommendations, they did three things which, which are not very scientific. First of all, they ignored all non-skeletal effects. They ignored cancer, cardiovascular disease, autoimmune diseases, respiratory infections, et cetera. Second, they demanded published randomized controlled clinical trials of, of vitamin D. And at the time when they did the study, all I could point to 
was um, uh, clinical trials for, for bone health. The third thing they did was they took a study from Germany which looked at uh, people who died in automobile accidents. So there were healthy people who just happened to die prematurely. And in the study, they, they, they looked at the osteoid uh, amount of the bones, in other words, the unmineralized calcium in the bones, sort of liquid or, or, or gelatin-like. And they also compared the, the 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentrations with, with the amount of um, this uh, poor bone mineralization. And what they did was they ignored the findings between 20 and 30 nanograms in terms of, of they still had a few at that point who had unmineralized bone, but they said that wasn't important, that most of the people with unmineralized bone were below 20 nanograms, so we're going to stick with 20 nanograms. It's been shown in many comments later on that that was a major mistake, and I think the Institute of Medicine now realizes that, but it took quite a few years to realize that. Now, in 2011, uh, the Endocrine Society, led by Michael Hollick, a team led by Michael Hollick, published a recommendation for dealing with vitamin D deficiency. Now, the first one, the Institute of Medicine, was for the general public, healthy or not. The Endocrine Society was dealing with, with people being treated by doctors for vitamin D deficiency. So they recommended uh, 1,000 to 2,000 IU per day of vitamin D2 or D3 and a, a serum con, a vitamin D concentration of around 30 nanograms per milliliter at least. Uh, they considered 20 deficient between 20 and 30 insufficient, above 30 uh, sufficient. However, uh, there are vitamin D advocacy organizations, which I'll name at the end, who um, have looked carefully at the, the journal literature as it comes out on a, on a daily and a weekly basis, and um, have, have, uh, some of these people have, have written um, uh, peer-reviewed papers on the benefits of vitamin D, and they've looked at uh, people with higher concentrations and, and how much better they do in terms of athletic performance or, or lack of disease. And they're recommending around 2,000 to 5,000 IU per day of vitamin D3, not skipping vitamin D2, and a serum concentration of around 40 to 60 nanograms per milliliter. Uh, one of the reasons for saying 40 to 60 is that looking at uh, healthy Africans, modern-day Africans who are outdoors every day with dark skin, uh, with, with some clothing on, I mean, they're not, not uh, just in loincloths, but they, they have um, a fair amount of clothing on, they have around 45 nanograms per milliliter of, of, of uh, serum 25-hydroxy vitamin D. Uh, and so you have these three um, recommendations. So, uh, well... Now, just to show a picture here, Roger Bouillon on the, on the left is one of the prom most prominent vitamin D researchers in Europe. Uh, I believe he's in Belgium. Uh, he's, a lot of European leaders are in the 20 nanogram per milliliter uh, camp. Michael Hollick, on the other hand, is the leader of, of the 30 nanogram plus uh, camp. Uh, now, there are three sources of vitamin D. Uh, the sunlight is the primary source. Uh, this map, uh, this is a, a shows, uh, on the bottom is a month of the year from, from January through December. Uh, along the y-axis, you have um, the latitude from uh, zero at the tropics up to uh, 90 degrees at the top. And the colors indicate uh, how much time you have um, to be in the sun in order to make, um, let's see, how much? Well, let's see. If, okay, if it's red, you cannot make any vitamin D. Uh, if it's in the blue to purple range, you can make some vitamin D. It's gonna take longer, uh, like maybe up to half an hour, an hour to be in the sun. And if it's black, uh, you can make it um, uh, fairly easily. So uh, we're about 38 degrees north latitude here. So in the winter, we have a difficult time making vitamin D, but by March or April through about October, we can make a, a fair amount of vitamin D. And this, this map was for 1,000 IU of, uh, per day of vitamin D. Now, if you need 2,000 to 4,000 to 5,000 IU per day, uh, this, the, the scale would be uh, changed. 
Also, it turns out that there's, there's a shadow rule. The dermatologists like to tell you if your shadow is shorter than you are, stay out of the sun or cover up or use sunscreen. The vitamin D advocates like to say, unless your shadow is shorter than you are, you're not going to make much vitamin D. Um, so that means you want to go out near solar noon. You want to go out in the, in the summer, spring, summer, and fall. Uh, you want to expose as much of your body as possible. Um, you want to go, uh, one of the reasons for going out midday in addition is that the ratio of UVA to UVB changes. Uh, the shorter the wavelength, the more scattering there is in the atmosphere. And the way you can tell that is the sky is blue and clouds are orange. So as a, a sunset and sunrise, the sun, goes, uh, sun rays go through a very, very large path, and the shorter wavelengths are scattering the, the wavelengths much more rapidly than they are the long wavelengths. So the orange gets to the clouds, the blue gets to the sky. Well, UVB is much shorter than the blue, and so it's scattered even more. In fact, even if you're under an umbrella, you're going to get UVB uh, impinging on you from the sides, the, 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 the diffuse scattering. But the UVB, the UVA, is going to be less scattered than UVB. In fact, UVB is about 3 to 5 percent of total UV, and the rest is UVA. The problem with UVA is that it penetrates the skin deeper and is more, more responsible for melanoma and basal cell carcinoma than UVB is. So if you went out morning and evening, uh, you're more likely to get melanoma, but no vitamin D. So I was in uh, Hungary uh, last month, uh, went over to attend conferences in Warsaw and Thessaloniki and stopped off in Budapest and found this, uh, looks like a porcupine with a sign under it saying sun. So the sun is one way to get your, your, your vitamin D, but you can also get it from a solarium. Um, the indoor tanning booths uh, maybe have 2 to 4% UVB in the UV. Uh, if you go in for tanning, you're going to stay much longer than you need to for vitamin D production. It turns out that after you make the, up to 20,000 international units of vitamin D uh, from whole body exposure in the sun in half an hour to an hour, uh, the, body's, the, the UV starts destroying the metabolites of vitamin D, so you can never make too much vitamin D in the sun. Uh, now, the other sources of vitamin D are supplements and diet. And in terms of diet, um, uh, it's animal products like seafood. But it turns out that, that uh, a study in England found that the people with the highest vitamin D concentrations were not the fish eaters, it was the meat eaters. The vegans had the lowest amount, the vegetarians a little bit higher, but there was about a, an 8 nanogram per milliliter difference between the meat eaters and the vegans. The reason is that meat has vitamin D as 25-hydroxyvitamin D. So most of the food tables that talk about vitamin D do not, re, re, do not include that in the study. Uh, so all these food frequency tables and how much vitamin D you get from your eggs and from your milk and so on, uh, they would find about 250 to 300 IU per day in the American diet, not counting what's in the meat. And of course, 250 to 300 IU per day is not enough to, to do much. Now, there are other effects of UV exposure. Uh, one thing you do is you get uh, beta endorphins, um, which uh, help reduce pain and help you feel better. In fact, the dermatologists realize that people often go to tanning beds on a regular basis because they get an endorphin high and they, they, it, the claim is that they're getting um, uh, addicted to tanning because of the beta endorphins. My, my thought is that anything that has long-term benefits, nature sometimes provides short-term benefits to make you understand that they're long-term benefits. And so I think this is a, you know, should be uh, applauded rather than uh, criticized. Another thing is you can release nitric oxide from some sub subcutaneous nitrogen compounds, which can lead to lower blood pressure. In fact, if you look at the latitudinal distribution of blood pressure, it's lowest in the tropics and highest in the high latitudes. Of course, that could also be related to dietary factors, but, but it could be related somewhat to, to UV. Uh, there are some, uh, uh, let's say, multiple sclerosis uh, has a very pronounced latitudinal effect. And for years, it was thought that that was because of vitamin D production. But now both uh, human studies and, and animal studies 
have indicated that there are benefits of UV aside from vitamin D production that reduce the risk of multiple sclerosis. Of course, there are other effects. Um, you can reset your biological clock uh, through the blue light around 420 nanometers. Uh, I found out when I went to, um, say, uh, Sweden in, in February, I was there for two weeks and never got on Swedish time. And last month I was in, in Warsaw for a week and it rained every day and I did not get on Warsaw time. Finally in, in, in Budapest I started with sunlight, I started to get over on the European time. Um, also it turns out that, uh, as I'll show later, that just getting outside and exercising uh, is very beneficial and has health effects um, independent of, of uh, vitamin D. So those most likely to have low vitamin D concentrations are those spending most time indoors. Uh, this would also include those who have sh do shift work and sleep during the day because they work at night. Uh, not being in the sun near solar noon when, with sufficient body surface exposed. Dark skinned people. Um, I'm working on a manuscript on the health benefits of vitamin D for dark skinned people in the United States. Um, uh, working with Bruce Ames on this. And um, see if. Uh, the average, the, the mean 25-hydroxyvitamin D concentration for white adult Americans is around 26 nanograms per milliliter. Uh, of course, there are seasonal variations. It can be a, a, a factor of two between summer and winter. Uh, for Hispanics, it's more like 21 nanograms. And for black Americans, it's more like 16 nanograms. Uh, so um, uh, um, yeah, in Africa, they had all the vitamin D they needed, but not here in the United States. Uh, those who are overweight or obese uh, generally have much lower vitamin D concentrations than, than those who, who are normal weight. Wearing sunscreen or even wearing, using uh, skin lightening cream um, uh, reduces the vitamin D production. And it turns out older folks uh, over the age of 60, perhaps even a little bit younger, have less of the 7-D hydrocholesterol in the, in the skin that, that is converted to, to vitamin D. Uh, and so they may, may need to stay in the sun two to three to four times longer to make the same amount of vitamin D. So there are values of measuring 25 hydroxy vitamin D. Uh, uh, and also it turns out that even if you take 1,000 or 2,000 IU of vitamin D per day, there's a large per variation in the response to, to vitamin D. Some people may make uh, twice as much 25 from the same amount of, 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 of vita uh, oral vitamin D. And it turns out it, it depends on whether you take it with a large meal so it goes slowly through your intestines, whether you're taking more magnesium to help the conversion to 25, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, if you really want to know where your, your co concentration is, you really ought to have your 25 hydroxy vitamin D measured. You can have your doctor do it, but you can also go to grassrootshealth.net or the vitamindcouncil.org. And both of them sell a blood spot uh, uh, kit. You get a little lance, you draw three or four spots of blood, put it on a card, it's dried blood, it's sent back to them, they, they send it to a laboratory, and they, they, it's very accurate. They use, hemo, they use an average hemocrit value for the entire population of around, well, so if your hemocrit is somewhat different from, from normal, that might be a slight error. But I've checked it out some time ago and when I was taking more like 5,000 IU per day and I got 65, 67, and 69 nanograms per milliliter depending on the blood spot test um, um, and two of the wet uh, chemistry uh, uh, labs. So I think they're quite ac accurate. Uh, Grassroots Health also has a program where you can have your, your 25 hydroxy vitamin D measured every six months and you're then entered into a scientific study. They want you to stay in it for about five years. They'll ever ask you a health question. How's your health? What did you, did you fall? Did you get sick, et cetera, et cetera. And they've actually used these um, results in several uh, peer-reviewed publications. So now we get into the benefits. Why you really want vitamin D? I'm gonna skip bones because I really haven't studied bones. Uh, that was sort of the classical vitamin D uh, area. And it's been the last almost two decades now <coughs> that the non-skeletal effects have become very important. And that's what I've studied. So there's cancer, there's respiratory tract infections, there's adverse pregnancy and birth outcomes, premature death, autism and ADHD, 
dental caries, poor sleep, cognitive dysfunction, Alzheimer's disease, erectile dysfunction, and low testosterone. So there's said to be something for everybody in here, if not you, your children, or your grandchildren. So the, um, the first link between UV exposure and lower risk of cancer was made by the brothers Cedric and Frank Garland, who as beginning graduate students at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health in 1974, saw a map something like this. It only had five color scales instead of 10, but they saw that there was lower colon cancer in the southwest and higher colon cancer in the northeast. They had just driven, driven from San Diego to Maryland, and they knew it was very sunny in, in, in the southwest and not very sunny in the northeast. So they hypothesized that since um, um, the, prime, uh, the, 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 the largest physiological effect of sunlight is vitamin D production, that vitamin D must reduce the risk of cancer. Well, it took them six years to get that paper published, and then it was in a, in a, 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 a British journal, um, which is finally, finally published it, but nobody really took much notice of it. In 1985, they showed that dietary vitamin D was linked to low um, cancer risk. In, uh, in 1989, they showed that low uh, serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D was linked to low colon cancer risk. They also ex extended this to uh, breast cancer and ovarian cancer. Uh, somebody else did prostate cancer and uh, lymphoma. But um, you can understand that since nobody was going to get rich selling vitamin D or selling sunlight, that the medical system just sort of said, not much. So I came along in 1999 uh, after doing some work uh, mentioned on, on dietary factors. And I saw these new maps that were published by the National Institutes of Health. Uh, and I saw all the red up the northeast, except for prostate cancer was in the northwest. Um, and I said, gee, maybe I can explain this based on dietary factors. But it only took two weeks to realize that we eat the same food countrywide, except in the south, we have a lot of barbecue. Now, if you look at these, you'll see uh, very similar patterns. Uh, breast cancer, again, high mortality rates in the northeast, but you have some, also some high uh, breast cancer rates along the west coast. Turns out that along the coast, you have more clouds and fog, and so people are not getting as much UVB along the coast as they were inland. Uh, so breast cancer is not quite as strong a link between UVB, vitamin D, and, and reduced risk as colon cancer. Uh, for kidney cancer, you'll see um, down in Louisiana some hot spots. That's because of the chemicals in the, uh, the chemical manufacturing there. Stomach cancer, you see a lot of red along the uh, Mexican border. That's because of hygiene and uh, much more H. pylori in, among Mexicans, so they get more stomach cancer. Prostate cancer is, 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 is weird. Uh, you see the red now has shifted more to the northwest and the blue more to the southeast. Uh, it turns out that both low and high 25 hydroxy vitamin D have about the equal uh, risk for prostate cancer. Uh, there's some benefit of vitamin D in fighting aggressive prostate cancer, uh, but it turns out that, that calcium is an important risk factor for, for prostate cancer. And since one of the benefits of, uh, one of the effects of vitamin D is to increase absorption of calcium, it could be that, that there's a sort of a trade-off between uh, having too much vitamin D and in, in inducing uh, too much calcium absorption that, that may uh, play a role here. It's still being debated by the, the in the peer review literature. I don't have a definitive answer on that, but. So what I did, um, I got the NASA data for UVB at the surface for July 1992. And you see it's very asymmetrical. Uh, the, the, the highest rates are in the southwest, Arizona and New Mexico. Uh, the lowest rates are northeast. And the reason you have higher UVB in the west than in the east is that the surface elevation tends to be higher. We have more mountains and, and even the, uh, our, the, like the Nevada desert is higher than, than, than the sea level. And then you have the westerly winds have to cross the Rocky Mountains, and in doing so, they push the tropopause higher and make the stratospheric ozone layer thinner. And it's the ozone in the stratosphere that blocks the UVB. So you have less absorption and less scattering in the atmosphere, so you have more UVB here. In the east, you also have more clouds and aerosols, which is not reflected in this map, but, but also plays a role. 
So uh, from um, ecological studies, we found about 15 to 20 types of cancer that are reduced from UVB ex exposure. And we think, uh, and we have evidence for a lot of these that higher 25-hydroxyvitamin D levels are correlated with lower uh, cancer risk, so, uh, either incidence or mortality rates. So it's colon, esophageal, laryngeal, oral, pharyngeal, rectal, and small intestine. The female cancers, breast, endometrial, uh, ovarian, and vulvar. Urogenital, bladder, kidney, prostate, and testicular. Miscellaneous organs, gallbladder, lung, pancreatic, and thyroid, and the blood uh, cancers, uh, lymphoma, leukemia, non Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, now, how much vitamin, what's the correlation between 25 hydroxy vitamin D and cancer incidence? Well, I made this, um, it's sort of a graphical uh, uh, meta analysis. Now, I've taken 11 studies from seven countries and merged them together uh, by uh, adjusting the, the odds ratio uh, uh, with respect to the 25 hydroxy vitamin D. So they all lay in the uh, same line. And now the units here are nanomoles per liter. You divide by 2.5 to get nanograms per milliliter. So what you see is below about um, 20 nanograms, you get a steep rise in, in the risk. And uh, when you get out to about 40 nanograms, you still have some reduced risk, but you're slowing down the uh, the 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 um, the, uh, incre the reduction in, in odds ratio. Um, the uh, the uh, dashed uh, line, dotted, uh, dashed lines on the outside show the 95% confidence intervals. In other words, this is the uncertainty from from the the measurements. Uh, I mean, certainly we have a, a, a this slope like this, and this seems to be typical for other uh, health outcomes as well. Although for some diseases, you may be a threshold at 20 or 30 nanograms rather than 40 or 50 nanograms like for cancer. And now we have results from, uh, uh, this was a recent clinical trial conducted in Nebraska with postmenopausal women with an average BMI of about 31 and a, a baseline 25 hydroxy vitamin D of around 33 nanograms. Uh, base, uh, body mass index. Oh, BMI, sorry. BMI. So these were obese people on average with high 25 hydroxy vitamin D. There were uh, about a, um, I think it was a thousand women involved uh, for four years. Um, and they were given 2,000 IU per day plus about a gram of calcium or placebo. Or, 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 yeah, or placebo. And um, it turns out that in the clinical trial, in the intention to treat, uh, they had one more cancer case in the treatment arm than, than would be the case if they had a less than a 1 in 20 chance that this was uh, 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 an effect found by chance. In other words, the P was less, P was 0 0.06 instead of 0 0.05. And so when, when the paper was published, JAMA set out a news release saying, Clinical trial shows that vitamin D does not re significantly reduce the risk of cancer. But the people at Creighton University, along with, with um, people from Grassroots Health and, and Keith Baggerly, said, now wait a minute. If we look at the serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D, most, the, the most recent measurement before they developed cancer, we find that those that had between 40 and, and 80 nanograms per milliliter has significantly reduced uh, risk of, of cancer compared to those with less than 40 nanograms per milliliter. Uh, but since they had not specified this as an outcome in the protocol, JAMA made them put it in the uh, online appendix, uh, the supplementary files, which was not seen by most people. Creighton University, however, issued a press release saying, see, we found a benefit. And so we had these two competing press releases and that who if people saw both were a little confused. Uh, for cardiovascular disease, uh, here's another observational study meta-analysis showing that below 20 nanograms per milliliter, there's an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Unfortunately, there have been no clinical trials that have confirmed that giving people vitamin D 
reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. So the question is, is this uh, maybe because they are out of doors more? Maybe they're exercising more out of doors? Uh, maybe they're eating a different diet? Um, or is there vitamin D? Maybe it's a long-term vitamin D effect, and if you do a two to four-year study, you don't find the effect. So this is still sort of up in the air about cardiovascular disease. Uh, seasonal influenza. Dr. John Cannell, who runs the Vitamin D Council, proposed in 2006 that influenza was largely seasonal due to seasonal variations in UV doses. He had been given, been giving his, he worked at Atascadero uh, Hospital for the Clinically Insane. He'd been giving his patients 5,000 IU per day. And in 2004, 2005, when an influenza epi epidemic came through the area, his patients were largely spared. So they got him thinking about, well, maybe vitamin D does reduce the risk of, of uh, influenza. In fact, shortly after his paper was published, the results of a clinical trial involving postmenopausal women in Long Island was, was reanalyzed, and they found that indeed those taking 2,000 IU per day had very few influenza or cold events, whereas those taking 800 had several, and those taking uh, 400 IU had quite a few. So that was one clinical trial that, that showed that yes, vitamin D did reduce, did reduce the risk of influenza. And then a, one involving Japanese school children showed that it reduced type A but not type B influenza. Uh, I might add that cold temperature and low humidity also in, contribute to the seasonality because the influenza virus lives better in a cold, dry environment. So that's why it can be passed from person to person in the winter. Um, but on the other hand, it's the vitamin D that's going to help you uh, induce cathelicidin to fight the influenza. Uh, pregnancy. Um, clinical trials in South Carolina found that pregnant women have better pregnancy and birth outcomes by taking 4,000 to 6,400 IU per day of vitamin D3 and reaching 40 nanograms per mill, uh, milliliter of 25 hydroxy vitamin D. The reason is that above 40 nanograms, the 125 uh, dihydroxy vitamin D concentration is stabilized leading to improved gene expression. And if there's ever a period of life when gene expression is important, it's during the fetal development period. So the benefits of vitamin D during pregnancy includes reduced risk of primary C-section delivery. Uh, and C-section delivery, uh, well, vaginal delivery is important to give the, the infant the, the, the gut biome it needs to, to get off to a healthy immune start. Uh, reduced risk of gestational diabetes, reduced risk of preterm birth, and for the infants, reduced risk of low for gestational weight, reduced risk of autism, and reduced risk of asthma. Uh, this is from the studies in um, South Carolina, and it's showing that below, below 26.5 nanograms per milliliter, there's uh, a, a reduction in the gestational age. Above that, there seems to be a plateau. So here's another benchmark for, for um, pregnant women. Uh, in terms of overall uh, uh, age-adjusted uh, mortality rate, uh, Cedric Garland and company advertised, uh, analyzed 32 uh, observational studies and found that uh, it took uh, 36 nanograms per milliliter before the uh, mortality rate uh, plateaued. And you see there's a pretty much a linear rise to uh, twice the mortality rate uh, at lower, at low, below 10 nanograms per milliliter. Is that infant mortality? That's adult mortality. Oh. So um, I've done my own analysis where I looked at um, uh, disease rates uh, in, in, in various countries and the observational studies for the relationship between 25 hydroxy vitamin D and, and um, incidence or mortality rate and found that um, if everyone um, well, the global average 25 hydroxy vitamin D is around 22 nanograms. It turns out because of skin pigmentation varying, uh, no matter whether you, where you live, uh, the population average is around 22 nanograms. Unless you're in a, a Middle Eastern country and wear too many clothes, then it's going to be lower. If you're African American, it's going to be lower and so on. But anyway, if you increase from 22 to 44 nanograms, uh, it appears that the vitamin D sensitive mortality rate would reduce by about 20%. And that accounts for about half of the, the deaths. And so this would uh, lead to a life expectancy increase by about two years. Athletic performance. Again, John Connell um, uh, wrote a paper, I think, in 2009. 
and he went through um, uh, a number of reasons why he thought that there'd be better athletic performance. Uh, for one thing, he pointed out that the Mexican Olympics in 1968 had a lot of world records, and that a lot of people had gone there to, to uh, practice beforehand to get used to the altitude. He thought it was not the altitude, but the UVB and the vitamin D. Um, so he published this 2009 in a, a sports medicine journal, and as a result, the Chicago Blackhawks became the first vitamin D team in modern professional sports, be, became the first vitamin D team in modern professional sports history. And according to John's sources, the Blackhawk team physician became, began diagnosing and treating vitamin D deficiency in all Blackhawk players uh, uh, about 18 months ago, written in 2010, and apparently most players were taking 5,000 IU per day. After losing many seasons, last year the Blackhawks came out of nowhere to get the Western Conference Finals. This year they're playing even better. <laughs> so uh, one thing it's going to do is reduce their risk of, of influenza and colds and all sorts of other respiratory infections. Uh, the other thing it's going to do is reduce the risk of stress fractures. Uh, another thing, uh, faster re uh, healing of wounds. So uh, very important. Uh, John and I, to, John also wrote the first paper on uh, vitamin D and the risk of, of autism. I worked with him in 2013. We got the prevalence data for children aged 6 to 17 years as a function of state. I, I looked at those versus uh, UVB doses in the summer for the, well, this is actually for October, and found that there was an inverse correlation between uh, UVB and um, uh, risk of, of autism. It turns out that African Americans have higher rates of autism than white Americans. They're darker skin, uh, making less vitamin D. And there are mechanisms uh, to explain why vitamin D deficiency in both in, in, in uh, utero and early life would lead to increased, increased risk of, of autism. Uh, ADHD um, um, it has a pattern which you see the lower rates in the southwest, higher rates in the east and northeast, again, is sort of uh, uh, looks like the UVB, uh, uh, inverse of UVB. Uh, dental caries, it turns out that um, there were data from the um, 20s, 30s, and 40s. Uh, and if I plotted the, the, the dental health uh, rank versus UVB dose, you see that um, below about 6.5 um, kilojoules per meter squared, there was a linear slope upwards, and above that there was a plateau. In fact, even a paper from 1865 showed that if you looked at the Union Army uh, soldiers, those from Maine and New Hampshire had lost quite a few teeth, whereas the, by the time you got to Kentucky or so, they had most of their teeth still intact. So even then, there was an effect of, of UV on dental health. Uh, in fact, the first clinical trial on vitamin D was w for children in England in 1928, w w w giving them vitamin D and looking at dental caries. And uh, they found that, yes, they reduced the risk of dental caries. And um, the woman doing the study uh, said that the bacteria were, were, were dead. She didn't know why, but we know why now. And this here shows that, um, that there were a number of studies, number of uh, clinical trials in the 30s and 40s, which showed a 50% reduction in dental caries for children taking vitamin D. Uh, sleep, it uh, turns out that raising uh, 25 hydroxyiron to 60 to 70 nanograms per milliliter does improve sleep. However, the woman, uh, Dr. Gominak, doing the study found that after two years, the people who started reporting systemic pain. One of her uh, patients helped her realize that it was because uh, uh, they were becoming vitamin, D, uh, vitamin B deficient. Uh, the back, gut bacteria are producing vitamin D. When you sleep, you restore the body through methylation, and methylation requires B vitamins, and so they're using up some B vitamins in the gut. And when she gave them uh, uh, B100, for, which has the multiple B, uh, in a couple months they got the gut back in shape and the pain went away and they were fine. Uh, there's also vitamin D verbal fluency, um, cognitive decline. There's Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Uh, this looks like below 20 nanograms, there's a problem. Erectile dysfunction, uh, below 20 nanograms per milliliter. Uh, testosterone, there's a study uh, uh, involving obese people in Austria, and they found that by giving them vitamin D, they did increase their testosterone. In fact, I've um, myself and two other men taking high doses of vitamin D found that when they were up around 60 or 70 nanograms per milliliter that they got the testosterone up. So it's a, um, 
In fact, that could help improve uh, athletic performance because testosterone helps muscles uh, build. Surgery, um, turns out that uh, people who go into surgery with higher 25 hydroxy vitamin D uh, recover more quickly, wounds heal faster, burns heal faster. So where is vitamin D policy headed? Well, uh, we have four or five or six major vitamin D supplementation trials which will uh, complete uh, co data collection this year or next year and then analyze the results. They generally use about 2,000 IU per day or 100,000 IU per, per month. Uh, and these studies, as imperfect as they are, will provide the basis for the next uh, recommendations. I was just in Warsaw, and this is a committee uh, reviewing posters um, uh, by the, this is Michael Hollick in front, um, looking carefully at the posters. Um, so I published a paper recently saying why clinical trials should be based on vitamin D, uh, on 25 hydroxy vitamin D, uh, because most of the trials are based on the, uh, uh, the assumptions used for pharmaceutical drugs. First of all, that the trial is a sole source of the agent, and second, that there's a linear dose-response relationship between um, the agent and the health outcome. Neither assumption is valid for vitamin, for vitamin D. Um, and uh, also, it turns out many of the trials do not bother to measure 25 hydroxy vitamin D. They just in, uh, in, you know, take the average healthy person, and so they get a healthy person effect that there's no benefit of more vitamin D. Uh, here we show that uh, from the grassroots health data set that uh, for people taking any, reporting that they're taking any value of, of, of of oral vitamin D, that there's about a, a 50 nanogram spread, plus or minus 50 nanograms, uh, of the 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentration. That's why if you really want to know what your vitamin D level is, you've got to have it measured. Um, it turns out that why do we need clinical trials? Well, observational tr studies could be um, uh, being using the 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentration as an index of diet or of UVB exposure. It turns out, um, uh, for example, that meat consumption increases uh, linearly from the, from the tropics. Uh, highest consumption rates are in the high latitudes. Um, if you have mechanisms, you don't know how, much, how important vitamin D is in reducing risk. The health systems looked at clinical trials as a gold standard. We're now in the evidence-based medicine uh, era, as imperfect as it is, but they're trying. Um, in um, Budapest, there's a lot of meat being sold, and so they can get... Um, Increase the risk of cancer and, aut and Alzheimer's disease, but they're getting some vitamin D, so it's a bit of a trade-off. Uh, so anyway, uh, we, we're proposing that um, all these trials be based on 25 hydroxy vitamin D, including the uh, measuring beforehand, choosing the participants, giving enough vitamin D to raise vitamin D levels high, measuring again, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, now, why you've never heard about the whole truth about vitamin D? This is from naturalnews.com. Well, there's the Federal Trade Commission that tells tanning companies they cannot advertise that tanning produces vitamin D. Uh, Big Pharma uh, sees that as competition. Komen, Race for the Cure, they don't want to cure, they, they don't want to prevent breast cancer, they want to manage breast cancer. The FDA, uh, they help sponsor the Institute of Medicine report. Uh, there's oncologists who make uh, $50,000, dollars in treating cancer. Uh, $10 a year for vitamin D to prevent cancer. No, we don't want that. And the National Cancer Institute. So uh, grassroots, uh, well, okay. Uh, I'm a co-author on a book coming out shortly called Embrace the Sun. Mark Sorensen um, is the primary author. And Dr. T, who's spoken here before, is doing a very careful text editing. Uh, Michael Hollick wrote the foreword for this. This should be available in November or December, and you can contact me and we can tell you how to get it. Now, for more information, uh, go to PubMed, which has 27 million uh, health publications listed there. Uh, uh, you can find access with scholar.google, grassroots health, Vibe D Wiki. Vibe D Wiki is run by Henry Lahore, who is a retired Boeing engineer who spends all his waking hours making vitamin D information accessible, vitamin D council, and the vitamin D society in cancer. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you.
Uh, it's uh, really refreshing to hear someone talk about being in the sun is really good for you. Um, we're I'm going to push a little bit beyond where we would normally try to stop. I want to take uh, a, a couple of questions if we have them, and then we need to Good start. Question. Then we can continue, yeah, after the, informally. So uh, any question yeah. for, for the group here, all right? I, I know some people, they take 50,000. Speaking the mic. 50,000 EU per day. What, what are the consequences? Well, the primary consequence of too much vitamin D is hypercalcemia. If you get hypercalcemia, you don't feel good. And so these people are taking 50,000, evidently feel fine. Uh, they do have very high 25 hydroxyvitamin D concentrations. Uh, I guess we'll just have to see what happens. Um, it stores, though, doesn't it? Say you took 50,000, they take it every day, you're saying, but if you took uh, it. Maybe, once a week. maybe not always. Yeah, if you took it once a week or. Hmm. Yeah, the, the vitamin D can store in the fat and the, the muscles. Yeah. The, the 25 uh, has a fast, okay. well, short half-life. I'm hoping you would ask a question. Uh, first of all, thank you for your contributions to the scientific community. Uh, second of all, uh, so I, my understanding is UVB is the best from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And uh, what would you recommend, like 20 to 25 minutes in the sunlight? Well, more like 10 to 2 uh, and... It depends on how much skin you can expose and your skin pigmentation. Um, so um, uh, if you're fair skinned and exposed, let's see, a young person exposing 10% of his body can maybe make, um, I forget, 20 to 30 IU per, per minute, maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. So maybe 25 to 50 minutes for a young person might be enough. But uh, if you can expose a quarter of your body, that's better. You cut down the time. Okay. Um, there are, there are UVB meters that, that tell you how much uh, time you would spend. Great, thank you. I will check that out. Okay, uh, one more quick, okay. So that's daily, but if you only get out once a week, but you're out for six to 10 hours and the half-life is long enough, you can get enough that way also, correct? Uh, yeah, you can make 20,000 in a day, mm -hmm. so, and, and you can store the ex, and the half-life is two and a half weeks, and you can store the vi excess vitamin D, so, that would probably do. Okay, um, let's go, do you mind to go ahead and ask your question one-on-one -on -one or? Yeah, just, there's a slide that I'd like We're gonna to get see. The, the one where the, um, the people are taking and they're, then they're measuring the dosages about four from the end or so. Uh, is that published somewhere? That seems like a really important slide. Okay. Um, we'll go ahead. Why don't you go ahead and... That's published in 2011. Yeah. Let's uh, uh, complete the evening. Thank you all for coming. We meet the third Thursday of every month.